Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 21st of the sixth month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, possibly the year 5910 from creation. Still working on that. Again, if Yahushua came and declared the year of Yahuwah Melchizedek's favor in the 80th Yobel or Jubilee, and we've done all the math right, then this year would be 5,910 from creation. So big if, not to hold to that to anything. But anyways, we are gathered today and we wanted to cover a topic that's come up. I think that's really relevant to our times. It's who is the fourth beast and who's ruling in the world today until our Messiah, Yahushua Mashiach, returns. And I've kind of put the cat out of the bag here there's proof in the text that we're going to share that rome is that fourth beast that was mentioned and rome is the one that is ruling the world even today although it's covertly there is massive amounts of evidence for it but we don't really need to go beyond what's written and we should never go beyond what is written to prove what is true Father willing, the more we all share and spend time together, the more we can see that and demonstrably prove it to ourselves so that we don't have to just take anyone's word for it, right? But, um, sorry about that. Today is the 21st of the sixth month. It's also the 31st of August, 2024, just for the connection there. And we'll get right in to these because there's a little bit here or 15 pages. We're going to try to go as quick as we can, okay? The first reference for the beast kingdoms is the book of Daniel. We're going to cover the whole thing just so you can see what it is. And there's no real argument, as far as I'm aware, about the other three beast kingdoms being Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Grecian Empire. There is some contention and arguments about the two little horns that are foretold. Some people think that they're both about the same individual. Uh, other people are aware that one comes out of the Grecian kingdom, and that's in the text, but that's all different stuff for another time. We're not going to worry about any of those things. Our whole point is to show that fourth beast unequivocally is Rome. Not just the pagan Roman Empire, but Rome in all of its many facets until our Mashiach's return. So Daniel 2, verses 29 through 45. As for you, king, on your bed your thoughts came up. What is going to take place after this? And there's no context. If you really want to know everything that was going on, please, I always recommend you read the whole chapters. We're going to kind of keep it to the point because we do have a lot to cover. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what shall be. As for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, because he was killing off the wise men, and these men are righteous. And that you should know the thoughts of your heart. You, king, were looking on and saw a great image. This image, or this great image and its brightness, excellent, was standing before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You were looking on until a stone was cut out without hands, and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind, or ruach, took them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled all the earth. Oh. This is the dream and its interpretation we declare before the king. 
You, O king, are a king of kings. For the Ella of the Shamayim has given you a kingdom, power, and strength, and preciousness. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the Shamayim, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. And after you rises up another reign or kingdom lower than yours, the Medo-Persian Empire. And another third reign of bronze that rules over all the land, the Grecian Empire. And the fourth reign or kingdom is as strong as iron, because iron crushes and shatters all. So like iron that breaks in pieces, it crushes and breaks all these. It will crush and break all the different kingdoms and take over those areas as well, right? Yet as you saw the feet of and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom is to be divided. But some of the strength of the iron is to be in it. Because you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom is partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw, iron mixed with miry clay, they are mixing themselves with the seed of man or men, but they are not clinging to each other, even as iron does not mix with clay. This will make more sense once we get into it, but the miry clay, it says, we are the potter, he is the clay, and that's talking about his children. All right, when they had went apostate the first time, they were divorced, and the northern kingdom was kicked out, and they went into Armenia, they went into, uh, by the Black and Caspian Seas, they were over there until the times of the advent of our Mashiach, and the emissaries went, and they preached the good news, and Dari or Andrew, if you will, the brother of Kepha, is the one that went to the Scythians. Others went to the Parthians, and these are Ephraim and Manasseh, if you will. The others went to other parts of these peoples. Um, Thomas, Toma, went to India, if you will, if I remember correctly. And they all went to different parts of what they call the Scythians there, or the Hebrews in dispersion, that eventually because the mass of the people still refused to repent, they were swallowed up into the belly of the beast like Yonah. They were, through time and uh, the inclination of peoples, herded or corralled out of the areas they were into Europe where they destroyed pagan Rome, broke it into ten kingdoms, and then uh, allowed the papacy to come to reign, as we'll see shortly. But that is the miry clay that is mixing with the iron here. And in just a moment, you'll see how it's even foreshadowed in a son of Yahuda, who was also part of the team that founded, that, that was part of the founders of Rome, right? One of the Julius, uh, of the Julius line himself. It says, and as you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they are mixing themselves with the seed of men, but they are not clinging to each other, even as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the Ella of the Shamayim shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, the stone kingdom, as mentioned by the late Charles Totten and others in the 1800s, is the common law countries that came about, the, the founding of these that were in during the times of these reigns that came, that was established, that will take over the world when he returns the prevalence of the common law ruling over all men. It says, nor the kingdom pass on to other people. It crushes and puts an end to all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Because you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great Ella has made known to the king what shall be after this, and the dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. 
Now he mentions that it's true and trustworthy because there's two witnesses to it. The dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar and then Daniel witnessed it second to him. But not to leave it in that way, we know that two witnesses establish every matter. It was first shown in Yahusuf's time with Pharaoh's dreams and with Yahusuf's dreams as well. He was given another vision that showed the same events in a different manner to confirm it. And then there's other visions that he was given later on. He gets into more detail with the Grecian Empire and the things that would happen during the uh, reign of the four Greek kings that split up the empire. It gives a lot of detail about that because that was going to happen sooner. And then you can see more detail about the fourth beast kingdom given later on from these times or from to other foretellers as it applied to other people, Ezra, Baruch, and um, elsewhere. Now we're in Daniel 7, verses 1 through 28. It says, They shall rise, and another shall arise. Oh. I'm sorry. That isn't the, the right number. Please forgive me. It didn't copy over right. I'll have to read it from here. Let me double check real quick and make sure that that is. Yeah, for some reason it did not copy over when I was doing that correctly. So, or when I was trying to share that. So please forgive me. So right here, if you can all see that, this is the next foretelling from Daniel chapter 12 or chapter 7, right here, 1 through 28. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babel, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, giving a summary of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I was looking in my vision by night and saw the four winds of the Shamayim stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I was looking until its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the land or earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and it was given a man's heart. And that was the Babylon. It was... Nebuchadnezzar, who was lifted up, the wings were plucked off, he was made like an animal, and then he exalted our creator after he came to his senses and worshipped and served him, or he was given two feet like a man and given a man's heart, right? And it says, and see another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its, in its mouth between its teeth, and they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. It's One side was greater than the other because it's the Medo-Persian Empire, and the three ribs were the three kingdoms, Lydia, Egypt, and Ethiopia, or Cush, that were conquered by them. It says, After this I looked and saw another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and rule was given to it, the Grecian Empire. And after this, I looked in the night visions and saw a fourth beast, fearsome and burly, exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the rest with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was thinking about the horns, then saw another horn, a little horn, coming up among them, and three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots before it. And see, eyes like the eyes of a man were in, it, were in this horn, 
and a mouth speaking great words or greatness. I was looking until I was looking until thrones were set up. So this fourth beast reigns until thrones are set up. And the Ancient of Days was seated, and his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like clean wool. His throne was flames of fire, its wheels burning. A stream of fire was flowing and coming forth from his presence, and a thousand thousands served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The judge was seated, and the books were opened. I was looking then because of the sound of the great words which the horn was speaking. I was looking until the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given to the burning fire. And we read that in Revelation. The beast and the false prophet are both tossed alive into the lake of fire. Satan is going to be imprisoned for a, a thousand years, right? And the rest of the beasts had their rule taken away, but a lengthening of life was given to them for a season and a time. I was looking in the night visions and saw one like the son of Adam coming with the clouds of the Shamayim. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And to him was given rulership and preciousness and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His rule is an everlasting rule which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my ruach was pierced within my body, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I drew near to one of those who stood by and asked him the certainty of all this. And he spoke to me and made known to me the interpretation of the matters. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which rise up from the earth. Then the set-apart ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. Right? And possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I desired for certainty concerning the fourth beast, which was different from all others, very fearsome, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the rest with its feet, and concerning the ten horns that were on its head, and of the other horn that came up, before which three fell. This horn, which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke great words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was looking, and this horn was fighting against the Kodashim, and was prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. All right, and this is why it mentions in Revelation, if you watch the Antichrist for Dummies series, part of the injunction to the Yahudim was he who, you know, if you pick up the sword against him, you're going to die by it. If you try to fight, this is the endurance and patience of the Kodashim. It was literally telling them, don't capitulate and do what they're doing, but don't fight against them because you're not given for that. It's not that time. It says, and right ruling was given to the set apart ones of the Most High, and the time came and the set apart ones took possession of the kingdom. This is what he said. The fourth beast is the fourth reign or kingdom on earth, which is different from all other kingdoms. And it devours all the earth, tramples it down, and crushes it. And the ten horns are ten kings from this kingdom. They shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and it is different from the first one, and it humbles three kings, and it speaks words against the Most High, and it devour or er, sorry, it wears out the Kodashim of the Most High, and it thinks to change times and law, or times and laws, 
and they are given into its hand for a time and times and half a time. Yet the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away its rule to cut off and to destroy until the end. And the kingdom and the rulership and the greatness of the kingdoms under all the Shamayim shall be given to the people, the Kodeshim of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all rulerships shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, and I kept the matter in my heart. The next section is from Daniel. This is just chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The reason why I mentioned this part is because this is a part that's talking about the same times of the fourth beast reign. You'll have to read all of chapter 12 for context, but it's kind of recapping some of the things that would happen. The reason why you can know that this is talking about it is because of what's in Gad the Seer chapter 2 that mentions that at the time Mikael shall stand up. So it directly connects these two. That's the reason why I'm sharing it here, and you'll see it in just a moment. But it says, Now at that time Mikael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. And if you remember, the one who is like El, the chief messenger, is given to be over the righteous remnant of his people that have that are not sinning. That's made abundantly clear in the shepherd of Hermas. And you can see it right here. Just as all the creation belongs to the Father, and they went wayward, so he left our Mashiach to be in charge of his own while he's taking care of the wayward sheep. Our Mashiach is leaving the 99 to go after the lost sheep. And he set Mikael, the one who is like El, over those righteous people. Uh, hand in glove, hand in glove pattern that we keep talking about there, right? Excuse me. But it, anyways, it says, Now at that time Mikael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of distress or tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation until that time. And we'll, that's for another time, but we'll keep going. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life, and some to reproaches, everlasting abhorrence. And those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who lead the brightness of the firmament was actually a, a name of a set of experiments done by Russia that was released by the CIA. Um, they had gathered the intel and they recently released it after their 50 years of keeping it secret. But the experiments they they did, they called, it was a test of the brightness of the firmament. Pretty interesting. It says, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. All right. So the next section that I have in mind to share is from the book of Tay Taffy. This part is relevant because it mentions Julius as the head of the Julius line where Julius Caesar came from. It gives a foretelling from Yahu to him about his people and the watch in the night that they're going to be responsible for. And it directly shows him being a man with miry clay on his feet, who is of the Romans there. But... Just for context, he's a son of Yahuda from the line of Zerah, from the survivors of Troy that had went pagan, not the righteous remnant. This is from Book of Taffy, chapter 5. Beaden, the son of Buki, goes to search the land and catches Julius, a man of the Romani, who is greatly angered thereat. The foreteller foretells upon him, and he departs. That's Yirmiyahu, or what we call Jeremiah, and the ship passes by an island and a prophecy is set thereon after they leave Italy. It says, then, men, or, then the men consulted together 
and marveled upon that spot, that Beodin the son of Buki was chosen of them by lot, to lead our skiff to the shore, and find of the folk thereby, what hap had fallen upon us, and whither our course should lie. Now Beodin brought us a man that they caught in a bushy field, on his head a brazen helmet, on his left arm a broad round shield, at his thigh a stiff or a short stiff falchion, his feet were mired in the clay, of the marsh where Beodin traced him, and caught him, or, and caught and brought him away. Now, the foretellings of Daniel were given after he was taken into captivity, but not. Um, yeah, it was they were given after the destruction of Yerushalayim by Babel. Yirmiyahu would have been contemporary with that. He would have been taking Te Taffy to Ireland after the destruction by Babel, but shortly around. So this may have been given before the visions from Daniel. However, the connections with the miry clay and the other things that you'll see here tie into other foretellers as well to all point what's going on. It says, Now the man bent not before us, but gazed with a steadfast eye on our engines of war and weapons, and spake no word of reply. Unto Bucky, or Buki, who spake all tongues, till the gaze of the foreteller fell, upon him compelling and silent, and then he spake full well, in a tongue that the Sissians use. I come from the she-wolf's fold, nigh at hand on the river, to seek a sheep of my fold. I am very wroth, ye phone, those are foes or enemies. I am wroth with the son of Dan. I am wroth with all amongst you, save this damsel and aged man. Save for these I had not spoken. Avoid you the she-wolf's lair. Of the hill of the great day, Father, I say unto you, beware. Now, um, we haven't really got into it too much, but we have talked about it a little bit. Jupiter, if you will, Jove. These are all different words for Yahoo Pater or the father Yahoo, who was the father of the kings of these peoples that were all deifying themselves and going apostate. And that's where the, a lot of the Greek mythology came from. Not all of it, but a lot of it came from that. And you can find reference and records of these in secular history as well as in scripture where they were, were going along doing the things of the nations and worshiping in ways that they, they were, and they were told not to. Right. But, um, it was the Phoenicians that you can see they called Israel Kronos and Yahuda Jupiter. And then you can see Zera, Zeus. There, there's other words where that came from, but it was perverted from what was originally established as time went on. That's the thing you have to keep in mind. Let's continue. If your course be west, sell westward, whither I would not know. For the door of Janus is wide wherever I have will to go. If I find ye, be ye heedful. My sword blade is short and strong, and my shield is wall before me. Bind me not with a throng. Least wolves in a pack be upon you. Julius has many mates that snarl in the lair, but howl as one from the towers and gates. The servant of El stood silent and gazed in that strong man's face. With eyes like star-filled sapphires, he spake of his name and place. Then bade his throngs be severed, that each before each might stand. Eye upon eye, and we parted, ourselves upon either hand. As the foreteller lifted his gaze to call down blessing and curse unto kindreds and peoples and times, unto better hap and to worse. Whilst that chief stood silent, proud, in his eye the forward gleam of a shield on the wall that holds the sun with a steadfast beam. 
Thou art set in the night to watch. Psalm 104, right? And then we'll get to another reference here. The towers of thy watch are seven. And not only seven hills, but the seven forms of government that, that Rome had went through, starting with the kingdom, then the republic, the triumvirate, the, the uh, I don't know all the different iterations of it, but there are seven different forms leading to the last one being the papacy that is currently going on. All right. As a strong man armed thou shootest thine arrows at the highest heaven. Did not I see thee afar by the Basra, the sheepfold, with long-built walls? Thou bendest three spears beneath it, upon the latest it falls. Thy swords are many and strong, thy quiver is wide and full. Thy shafts are swiftly sped over all the plain of the bowl, which is Ephraim. Yawin and Katim are pierced. Yawin was the son of Yepheth, and Katim was the son of Yawin. If you remember, both of them, this is what the Hebrews mixed with them and became the Greeks. Not all of them, but some of them. And the Hebrews mixed with them and became the, the Romans, the Latinum peoples, right? The others of the family here, there's a lot of evidence that Yawin went to the Far East, and they're what we call the Orientals. Um, of old China and whatnot, becoming the largeness of Yefeth, right? That was foretold by Noach there. But the etymology of Katim is all over that area as well. So there was a gentleman, when I put in the video, we were talking about how the Katim is Rome in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He had made a comment about how the Katim, the etymology, sorry, the etymological information for his name and the things that you can see in the place markers are all over in the Far East, which I thought was very interesting. So I just had to send a comment to them that while I'm grateful they shared that, because I, I do like to know that in the scriptures, for our purposes, the Katim is equated to Rome. And that's something that you're going to see just through the course of what's going on here as well. This is... Yawin and Katim are pierced. Eber, Spain, and Put, Put, are low. Lud and Aram are stricken before the strength of thy bow. Mitzrayim is thine, and the half of Gomer's bands, and the Gaal. All shall be given thy prey, because thou hast cast down Baal. He put an end to paganism overtly, right? That's why the Romans have been standing for such a long time, as it was given right here. On the silver wall of the islands thy farthest hunting shall be, ere the packs of the wolf are stayed by the dams of the stormy sea. War is thy birthright, war is thy joy, and warfare thy bane. Peace shall be very near you, and under you peace be slain. Our Mashiach who is our Shalom, right? The Shar Shalom, or Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, they call it. In the street of the Kodesh city, iron and brass and clay, thou stands and shall be broken, thy watchtowers be for a prey. To the beasts of the field, and the fish of the sea, and the fowls of the air, thine helm is parted asunder, the crown of thy head left bare. To the winds of the east and the north, out of Magog, Gomer, and Tor, with the biting hell you are driven, your sword blade has lost its spur. In the lap of thy wives, in the fullness of feasts, in the slavehood of power, thy fetters of gold thou art lost, or in thy fetters of gold thou art lost, yet there cometh a late hour. And this is about the papacy right here. When swordless you rise again with a woman's cunning device of a tongue and snares of the eye, the souls of men to entice. By the name you hate at heart, you call the nations afar. 
your words in your mouth are honey, but as wormwood your actions are. This also long will I bear, till the goats be set from the sheep. For I set you a watch of the night, and this my watch shall you keep. We won't get too far into that, but that wanton woman that is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that, that foolish woman throughout the Proverbs is alluded to, that, that's mentioned spiritually here, is what we'd call the papacy. Okay, it's also equated to Edom, as we'll see here in a little bit, because born in the same womb as Yaakov, the renewed covenant believers, they rise up against them and persecute their brethren. <laughs> These things he spake to Julius and bade him hide in his heart. The blessings and cursing mingled and gave him grace to depart. We don't need to read the rest of that. It's just that it moves on to the foretelling about <clears throat> what would be for those islands. But as you can see, Julius was given a foretelling about being set in a watch for the night and uh, all the different things they would do by conquest with war and then how they would change their ways and entice men's souls. Very, can't get more plain than that, but we're going to continue because there's even more. This is from Gad the Seer, chapter 2. Sorry about that. So this is from Gad this year, chapter two. It says, after these L breathe things, or sorry, after these true things, please forgive me, I had an L breathe vision. And that usually is divine, which you could say Elohim's vision, or I put L breathe because that's divine, the essence of it. I can't tell you what the original word should have been, just to be perfectly clear. This is after these true things, I had an l breathe vision saying, set your face eastward, northward, southward, and westward, and whistle with your mouth as a bird whistles to its chicks and say, four corners of the earth, hearken to the word of Yahuwah. Hearken means to incline your ear. Thus said Yahuwah, who sits and dwells over the cherubim, give, give, give. Take out, take out, take out my seed that I have sown in you, for the time for the seed has come. Now, if you know the one who sits between the cherubim as our Mashiach and his seed is the word, the parable of parables, this will make more sense to you. For yet a little while I shall collect my seed on my threshing floor, and the threshing floor will be Kadosh, an impure seed will not be found in it. And remember, the third commandment, if you're not familiar, I, I beg everyone, look at the Hebrew, go to a Strong's interlinear, if you will. But the third commandment doesn't say that he will not leave the one who brings his name to not unpunished. It says he will not cleanse or purify them. Entirely different. The impure seed will not be found in it. For before those days, my seed was mixed with lentil and barley and spelt beans and gourd. And in the end of days, the sower shall be true and the seed shall be true. And from the seed, the word, all the land will be Baruch. Be joyful and glad, remnant of Yahuda, the remnant of those who confess, acknowledge, and praise Yahuwah and rejected of Yisrael, the rejected of those who strive with men in El and overcome, or the one who is a prince of El. For deliverance is with Yahuwah. As you shall be a curse and blasphemy to all the families of the earth, so shall you be a Baraka and favor forever. At that time, no cursed or unkadosh people will be found among you, for everyone will join you in the covenant, in the Torah, testimonies, statutes, and ordinances, or keeping the common law. And you and they shall have one L, one covenant. Oop, didn't mean to do that, sorry. One covenant, one Torah, one language, 
for all shall speak in the Yahudith language, the Kadosh language. Happy are you, Yisrael, who is like unto you a people delivered by Yahuwah. For he shall go before you to fight your wars with your enemies. Woe to you, Edom, that sits in the land of Katim, in the north of the sea, which is the Mediterranean. Now, I'm, I'm mentioning that you'll plainly see that the Katim is Rome in just a minute, but you can see that they are equated to Edom directly right here. This is where you can now look at all the references to Edom throughout Scripture with the spiritual application of Rome. Okay? Just as Yishmael was the first covenant believers, as Hagar was the first covenant in Mount Sinai, directly said by Shaul, right? These are the parables that their lives were, were foretelling. Ob willing, you guys can start to see that a little better. But this is, Woe to you, Edom, that sits in the land of Katim in the north of the sea. For your destroyers will emerge from a terrible nation, not leaving you a remnant. For you have said, on high is my seat, and I have knowledge of the El of Elohim. For Yahuwah chose me instead of his set-apart people, for he loathed them. And his former people, despised and rejected, did not know Yahuwah or his image. Truly, we are wise and clever. We know Yahuwah and his law. We know his image and presence. Therefore, thus said Yahuwah, and if you're not aware... If you look at the anti-Mashiach for dummies videos, it'll talk about what Rome used to do as pagan Rome to conquer other nations. They would do witchcraft rituals, right? Paganism or the worship of these false mighty ones is what we call paganism or witchcraft. It's only went from mainstream to, to off in the occult or hidden. But one of the things they would do is called the invocatia, and it would basically be to invite the deity of a nation to become theirs. And once it was accepted, then they would go destroy that nation because now they, they have their Elohim behind them. And that's what they used against the Yahudim and then adopted all of the stuff in uh, perverted worship to take it over. But it, that's exposed in the Antichrist for Dummies. However, it's spoken of right here with what they had said and did. This is, therefore, thus said Yahuwah, because you rose so high to talk about the El of Elohim, know that you shall perish in your cleverness. For why would you put confidence in man, in the little horn, in whose nostrils is his breath, which come which came up in a night like a day shadow that passes by sitting him or setting him to sit beside Elohim for it is not you whom i knew formerly and where is the bill of divorce of my people that you said should be a prey or would be a prey show it to me your corpses will fall among my people jealous yahuwah come out Come out of your place and thrash Edom. There's foretellings about that. Who will come, you know, who will lead me to Edom? Now you get the context, right? And now you know why Edom he's hated. Because if you read the book of Yobelim, he conspired from his heart after he swore oaths not to. Uh, he conspired to do evil against his brother. This has come to or come out of your place and thrash Edom, consume them. Come to Zephyrath, come to Sepharad. You find in the Geneva scriptures, in the footnotes, Zephyrath is France, Sepharad, we know Sephardic Jews, if you will, but Sepharad is Spain, Ashkenaz is Austria, Bavaria, the, the area that it's talking about, and Germany, Germania, Garmania here is the the genuine Scythians, but this is foretellings before they happened of these very locations of where the Holy Roman Empire has been for its whole existence. That's the geographic location of what's going to be destroyed right here. 
But it says, come to Zephrath, come to Sepharad, come to Ashkenaz, come to Garmania. They shall come and fall in the nethermost pit, in destruction and in the shadow of death. For your mouth will fail you, and no one will help you. And here's the connection to Daniel 12. At the end of days, Mikael, the great prince, shall stand up in war like a whirlwind against Samael, the poison of El, the prince of the world, to put him under his feet. In the wind of Yahuwah, and it shall be eaten up, for Yahuwah has spoken it. At the end of days, the robbed will overcome the robber. We're all being robbed and plundered right now, even if you might not be aware of it, especially in America, in Britain, and the uh, common law countries that are paying taxes and other things contrary to law. It says the weak, the strong, meaning they will overcome them, truly and in righteousness. Your El is your deliverer, Yisrael. With him you will be delivered. For he is a merciful Elohim. He will not abandon you. For you shall keep on doing all that I commanded you in the Torah of Moshe, my servant. All right, now the next section here is uh, Second Baruch. There is quite a bit here, but it's covering different places. Please bear with me. It's all relevant to the topic at hand of what the fourth beast is, just so we can see that we're not adding to or taking away from anything. This is the apocalypse of the forest, the vine, the fountain, and the cedar. I, Baruch, went to the Kodesh place and sat on the ruins and wept and said, that my eyes were springs and my eyelids that they were a fountain of tears. For how shall I be sad over Zion and lament over Yerushalayim? Now it mentions in the Psalms that if I don't hold Yerushalayim above my chief joy, right, let, let my right hand forget, right? It's the disposition of an honest believer. Not about the physical buildings that are there, but the Shamayim Yerushalayim, the mother of us all, lamenting over her desolation is what brought him to paradise. Just want to point that out. For at the place where now I am prostrate, the high Kohanim used to offer Kodesh sacrifices and place thereon incense of fragrant spices. Now, however, that of which we are proud has become dust, and that which our soul desires is ashes. And when I had said this, I fell asleep at that place and saw a vision in the night. And behold, there was a forest with trees that was planted on a high plain, or sorry, on a plain and surrounded by high mountains and rugged rocks. And the forest occupied much space. And behold, over against it, a vine arose, and from under it a fountain ran peacefully. And that fountain came to the forest and changed into great waves, and those waves submerged the forest and suddenly uprooted the entire forest and overthrew all the mountains which surrounded it. And the height of the forest became low, and that top of the mountains became low, and that fountain became so strong that it left nothing of the great forest except one cedar. When it had also cast that one down, it destroyed the entire forest and uprooted it so that nothing was left of it, and its place was not even known any more. Then that vine arrived with the fountain in Shalom and in great tranquility, and arrived at a place which was not far away from the cedar, and they brought to him that cedar which had been cast down. And I saw, and behold, that vine opened its mouth and spoke, and said to the cedar, Are you not that cedar which remained of the forest of wickedness, or inequity? Because of you, inequity remained and has been done during all these years, but never goodness. And you possessed power over that which did not belong to you. You did not even show compassion to that which did belong to you. 
and you extended your power over those who were living far from you, and you keep those who are close to you in the nets of your inequity, and you uplift your soul always like one who could not be uprooted. But now your time has hastened, and your hour has come. Therefore, cedar, follow the forest which has departed before you and become ashes with it, and let your, your earth be mixed together. And now sleep in distress and rest in pain until your last time comes in which you will return to be tormented even more. And after these things I saw that the cedar was burning and the vine growing, while it and all around it became a valley full of unfading flowers, and I awoke and arose. And I prayed and said, the same thing that we mentioned earlier, his taught ones come to him and seek the truth from him on the things that they do not know. They don't go elsewhere. They don't go beyond him. Right. And I prayed and said, Yahuwah, the king or Elohim, our master, you are the one who has always enlightened those who conduct themselves with comprehension. The one doing his commands has comprehension. Your Torah is life and your Hokmah is the right way. Now show me the explanation of this vision. For you know that my soul has always been associated with your Torah and that I did not depart from your Hokmah or wisdom from my earliest days. And Yahuwah answered and said to me, Baruch, this is the explanation of the vision which you have seen. As you have seen the great forest surrounded by high and rocky mountains, this is the world. Behold, the days will come when this kingdom that destroyed Zion once will be destroyed and that it will be subjected to that which will come after it. So Babylon was destroyed and subjected to the Medo-Persian Empire. This again will also be destroyed after some time, and another, a third, will rise, and also that will possess power in its own time and will be destroyed. This is the Grecian Empire. After that, a fourth kingdom arises whose power is harsher and more evil than those which were before it, and it will reign a multitude of times like the trees on the plain, and it will rule the times and exalt itself more than the cedars of Lebanon. That is code name for the righteous. It says the righteous flourish like a palm tree. They grow like a cedar in Lebanon in Psalm 92. And they're also used as a code word for the righteous, the council of the community in the Peshars from the Dead Sea Scrolls. The cedars of Lebanon are also used for the wicked that are under Carmel, or the leader of the Bashan, which is the Katim, the leader of the anti mashiach or the Little Horn, if you will, being over Rome, and those that were supposed to be like the, the, the cedars of Lebanon, but they went perverted. So that's actually used for both of them, which I find to be very interesting and also literally true. The ones who should have been the council of his community are the ones that are actually serving the enemy in that the belly of the beast, if you will. It says, And the truth will hide himself in this, and all who are polluted with unrighteousness will flee to it, like the evil beasts flee and creep into the forest. Again, that's an allusion to Psalm 104. I highly recommend you check that out. Although it, the moon doesn't have anything to do with appointed times there. If you read the Septuagint version, it mentions a different thing. But anyways, and it will happen when the time of its fulfillment is approaching, in which it will fall, that at that time the dominion of my Mashiach, which is like the fountain and the vine, will be revealed. Uh, that's the crux, the fourth kingdom, until our Mashiach comes, just like it mentioned in Daniel that we already read, right? And when it has revealed itself, it will uproot the multitude of its hosts. 
we've already covered that before, but it mentions that Yisrael is his battle axe and sledgehammer, his threshing sledge, which he was going to use to, to thresh all the nations that rise up against him. And it's literally been our forefathers, even when they've suffered, they've been the ones to overthrow every one of these people. Within 120 years of the Assyrian Empire overthrowing the Northern Kingdom, Scythian mercenaries with Babylon destroyed the Assyrians as a people. The Scythians and Hebrews in dispersion were also mercenaries that helped the Medes and Persians overthrow Babylon. And then they fought against Darius and the Persians and defeated them in major battles as well when they were rising up against them and aggressors towards them. And then they were literally the ones that came in and destroyed pagan Rome and broke it up into 10 kingdoms as a type of what would come because we're used, just as you saw the waters here, to do his judgment in the world, just like when they were brought into Canaan and wiped everyone out, right? It's been that consistent throughout history, but we haven't been cognizant of those things all the time. So it says, And that which you have seen, namely the tall cedar, which remained of that forest, and with regard to the words which the vine said to it, which you heard, this is the meaning. The last ruler who is left alive at that time will be bound, whereas the entire host will be destroyed, and they will carry him on Mount Zion, and my Mashiach will convict him of all his wicked deeds, and will assemble and set before him all the works of his hosts. And after these things, he will kill him and protect the rest of my people who will be found in the place that I have chosen." And his dominion will last forever until the world of corruption has ended. See, his dominion will last until the world is corrupted and until the times which have been mentioned before have been fulfilled. So even after he comes, corruption isn't ended because the millennial reign is going on. You still have men that will be born, living, and dying during that time. And it's not until after Satan's release, like we've mentioned, that you have our forever after in which there is no more death, no more tears. No more corruption. This is your vision, and this is its explanation. All right, the next section right here is um, from what we call 2nd Esdraez or 4th Ezra. The first part is from right here, chapter 6, and this is just two verses to show you he's being shown visions of the night to come. Just like you saw foretold to Julius where he was going to be in place for a watch in the night. Okay? And again, you can look at what's in the common scriptures that we have. Our Mishiach is the light of the world. Night is coming. No one's able to work. Work while it is day. These are all allusions to the, what was coming through Rome in what we call the papacy. This is, while he spoke to me, behold, little by little, the place where I was standing began to rock to and fro. And he said to me, I am come to show you the time of the night to come. The fifth vision, chapter 11, the eagle vision. On the second night I had a dream, and behold, there came up from the sea an eagle, which had twelve feathered wings and three heads. It says Daniel 7, 3 here. And I saw, and behold, she spread her wings over all the earth, and the winds of the Shemaim blew on her, and the clouds were gathered together about her. And behold, or and I beheld rather, and out of her wings there grew other contrary wings, and they became little pudgy wings. But her heads were at rest, the head in the middle was greater than the other yet rested it with the rest with them. Moreover, I looked, and behold, the eagle flew with her wings and reigned upon earth and over them that dwelt in it. And I saw that all things under the Shamayim were subject to her, and no man spoke against her, no, not even one creature that is on earth. And I looked, and that's witness to of Kephas is no man gainsays or take, tries to say he's taking the place of Caesar or speaks against him, on at least on pain of death. But they dare to blaspheme and speak evil of the Elohim, the creator of all things, right? So it's witness to that 
they were they had the whole world cowering not everyone not everyone was subjected to rome even in the height of their power they fought against ephraim or the parthians and could not overcome them at that time because they were walking in a way that was pleasing to our maker for a while but once they went apostate once the rulership there started consorting with demons quite like Shaul did, con consorting with familiar spirits, he was told, oh, your kingdom is going to be taken and you're going to die. And that's when the Persians rose up, defeated the Parthians in three battles, and then said either convert to fire worship or leave. And that was the end of the Parthian Empire. That after that, shortly after, is when Odin took the Parthian hordes and started making his migrations north and then west into Europe. This is, and I saw that all things under the Shemaim were subject to her, and no man spoke against her, no, not even one creature that is on earth. And I looked, and behold, the eagle rose upon her talons, and of bronze, remember, Right? and uttered a cry to her wings, saying, Do not all watch at the same time. Let each sleep in her own place, and watch by the course of her turn. But let the heads be preserved for the last. And I looked, and behold, the voice did not come out from her heads, but from the middle of her body. And I numbered her opposing wings, and behold, they were there were eight of them. Okay, 12 feathers and eight opposing wings, just to keep in mind there. And I looked and behold, on the right side there arose one feather and reigned over all the earth. And so it was that when it rained, the end of it came and the place thereof appeared no more. So that, or so the next wing following stood up and reigned and had a long reign. Now, it should have said feather right there with the feathers, or no, wings, they're right. No, I was right. There's The first was 12 feathers, and then there was eight wings, but it messes up here and says the next wing stood up. The point being, you start the chronology here with this feather that reigns with Julius Caesar, and the second one that reigned reigns longer than any other, which would have been Augustus. He was the longest reigning Caesar for over 50 years. And there was not a Caesar or anyone after that time that even achieved half the years that he reigned, exactly as it foretells right here, and helping to show when this starts, okay? You find out more that it's Rome later on. But just to keep you in line, the eight or the 12 feathers would be the eight Caesars from Julius to Domitian. Then you have the eight emperors, the Roman emperors, and then the, the struggle of the kingdom, the infighting with the, the co-regents and what you had, and it culminated in the rise of Constantine by himself. And then you have the amalgamation later, splitting of the two, and then the Eastern and Western Roman Empire, and then the coming of the papacy, right? All of that foretold in what you'll read in this uh this parable here it says and it happened that when it rained the end of it came also like as the first so that it appeared no more then came there a voice to it and said hear you that have borne rule over the earth so long this i say to you before you begin to appear no more there shall none after you obtain to your time neither to the half thereof then arose a third wing, and reigned as the other before, and appeared no more also. So it went it with all the wing one after another, as that everyone reigned with power, and then appeared no more. Then I looked, and behold, in due process of time, the wings that followed stood up upon the right side, that they might rule also. And some of them ruled, but within a while they disappeared suddenly, and some of them rose up, but did not rule. After this I looked, and behold, the twelve wings appeared no more, nor the two little wings. And there was no more upon the eagle's body, 
but three heads that rested and six little wings. Then saw I also that two little wings divided themselves from the six and remained under the head that was upon the right side. But the four continued in their place. And I looked, and behold, these two little wings planned to set themselves up and hold the rule. And I looked, and behold, there was one set up, but suddenly disappeared. And the second also, and this disappeared more quickly than the first. And I looked, and behold, the two that remained were planning between themselves to reign together. And when they were planning, behold, there awakened one of the heads that were at rest, namely the one that was in the middle, for that was greater than the other two heads. And I saw how it allied the two heads with itself, and behold, the head turned with two that were in it, or that were with it, and did eat up the two little wings which were planning to reign. Moreover, this middle head gained control of the whole earth, with much, or and with much oppression dominated its inhabitants, and it had greater power over the world than all the wings that had gone before. And after this I looked, and behold, the middle head suddenly disappeared and was no more, just as the wings had done. As for your hearing a voice that spoke, coming not from the eagle's heads, but from the midst of his body, this is the interpretation. That after the time of that kingdom there shall arise great strivings, and it shall stand in peril of falling. Nevertheless, it shall not fall then, but shall regain again its former power. And that was after the times of the Caesars, the schisms and things that we just mentioned, right? You can read about it in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and other histories of what happened to them. And whereas you saw the eight little wings under wings clinging to her wings, this is the interpretation. That in him there shall arise eight kings, whose times shall be short and their years swift. And two of them shall perish when the middle of their time approaches, and four shall be kept for the time when its end began to approach, but two shall be kept until the end. And whereas you saw three heads resting, this is the interpretation. Oh, I'm sorry, it, it cut out more again. I'm very terribly sorry. We need to go back over here real quick and not miss out what we should have been reading. All right, here's here's the part in fourth Ezra we are still at. It was on the it, the head was raining when we looked. So we'll start right here, verse thirty. And it says, and I saw how it allied the two heads with itself, meaning the first head. And behold, the head turned with two that were with it and did eat up the two little wing, which were planning to reign. Moreover, this middle head gained control of the whole earth and with much oppression dominated its inhabitants. And it had greater power over the world than all the wings that had gone before. And after this I looked, and behold, the middle head suddenly disappeared and was no more, just as the wings had done. But there remained the two heads, which also ruled over the earth and its inhabitants. And I looked, and behold, the head upon the right side devoured the one that was upon the left side. Then I heard a voice which said to me, Look before you, and consider what you see. And I looked, and behold, a creature like a lion was aroused out of the forest, roaring, 
And I heard how he uttered with a man's voice to the eagle and spoke, saying, Hear you, I will speak with you what the Most High Yahuwah shall say to you. Are you not the one that remained of the four beasts, whom I made to reign in my world, that the end of my times might come through them? So the, the this is the the one that remains of the four beasts, the last one, okay? And you, the fourth that has come and has conquered all the beasts that have gone before and had power over the world with great fearful terror and over all the earth with much grievous oppression, and for as long as you have dwelt upon the earth with deceit, and you have judged the earth but not with truth, for you have afflicted the meek, you have injured the peaceable, you have hated those who tell the truth, you have loved liars, and you have destroyed the dwellings of them that brought forth fruit, and have cast down the walls of them as did you no harm. Therefore is your insolent wrongful dealings has come up before the Most High Yahuwah, and your pride before the Almighty. And the Most High Yahuwah has also looked upon his times, and behold, they are ended, and his ages are completed, and his abominations are fulfilled. Therefore, you will surely disappear, you eagle, and your terrifying wings, and your most evil little wings, and your malicious heads, and your most evil talons, and your whole worthless body, so that the whole earth be freed from your violence, and may be refreshed in return, being delivered from your violence, and that she may hope for the judgment and mercy of him that made her. And it came to pass, while the lion spoke these words to the eagle, I looked, and behold, the remaining head disappeared, and the two wings that had gone over to it arose and set themselves up to reign and their reign was brief and full of tumult. And I looked, and behold, they also disappeared, and the whole body of the eagle was burnt, so that the earth was exceedingly terrified. Then I awoke in great perplexity of mind and great fear, and I said in my Ruach, Behold, you have brought this upon me, because you search out the ways of the Most High Yahuwah. Behold, I am still weary in mind and very weak in my Ruach, and not even a little strength is left in me because of the great fear with which I have been terrified this night. Therefore will I now beseech the Most High Yahuwah that he will comfort and strengthen me to the end. And so I said, Yahuwah that bear rule, if I have found favor in your sight, and if I have been accounted righteous before you beyond many others, and if my prayer has indeed come up before your face, comfort and strengthen me and show me your servant the interpretation and meaning of this terrible vision, that you may fully comfort my inner being. For you have judged me worthy to be shown the end of the times and the last events of the time. And he said to me, This is the interpretation of the vision which you have seen. The eagle whom you saw come up from the sea is the kingdom which was seen in the vision of your brother Daniel, the fourth beast that was more terrifying, right? But it was not expounded to him, therefore now I declare it to you. Behold, the days shall come, that there shall rise up a kingdom upon earth, and it shall be more terrifying than all the kingdoms that have been before it. And twelve kings shall reign in it one after another. But the second that is to reign shall have more time than any of the twelve. This is the interpretation of the twelve wings signify which you saw. And as for your hearing a voice that spoke, coming not from the eagle's heads, but from the midst of his body, this is the interpretation. 
that after the time of that kingdom there shall arise great strivings, and it shall stand in peril of falling. Nevertheless, it shall not fall then, but shall regain again its former power. And whereas you saw the eight little wings clinging to her wings, this is the interpretation, that in him there shall arise eight kings, whose times will, shall be short, and their years swift. That would be the eight emperors after, from Trangin on to Nero, I believe. Okay. Or, I'm sorry, not Nero, but you, it's the eight kings or emperors that came after the time of Domitian and the schisms and the, the strivings that were happening that they're talking about here, right? And it says, And two of them shall perish when the middle of their time approaches, and four shall be kept for the time when its end begins to approach, but two shall be kept until the end. And whereas you saw three heads resting, this is the interpretation. In his last days shall the Most High raise up three kingdoms, and they shall renew many things in it, not found, but renew. A lot of people, they talk about the mark of the beast and all this stuff with digital dollars and things that are... None of that's really the mark of the beast or the prohibiting buying and selling and things of that nature. Those are, forefill, those are foretellings that have already happened during the reign of the 44th or the 45th Bishop of Rome, who is Sixtus III, the literal 666 of Revelation. But they renew these things and they shall have dominion over the earth, right? We can follow the history of how Unum Sanctum came about. Literally, when the dark horse rider was in the sky, the stars that that talks about, the first time was when Vespasian and Titus were going into the land to ruin it, to decimate it, to steal their stuff, and to wipe out a lot of people. That was around 68 to 70 AD. The second time you see the stars in alignment as they were for the dark horse rider, as mentioned in the Antichrist for Dummies videos, is when the papal bull for the Unum Sanctum went out, where they claimed the rights over every man, all land, souls, and property. And then you can find that's part of the Sistic Trust that was established with the 1666 Act in England after the times of the King Stuart, who officially made the high church party the standard for religion in England, which was an amalgamated Catholic uh, thing. It caused the Puritans to leave. All of this is known history that we don't get taught a lot, but I'm trying to share with you the, the stuff that this is pointing to, right? The three kingdoms, however, are like the three city-states where you have the papacy, the business district of London, and Washington, D.C. Not the entire nation's. But just as Yahusuf was used by Pharaoh, the sons of Joseph or Yahusuf have been used by Rome in that very same capacity on a larger scale here, which we'll, we'll get more to in the course of time. This is in his last days shall the Most High raise up three kingdoms and they shall renew many things in it and they shall have the dominion of the earth and its inhabitants more oppressively than all who were before them. Therefore, they are called the heads of the eagle. For these are they who shall accomplish his final inequity or wickedness and perform his last actions. And whereas you saw that the great head appeared no more, it signified that one of them shall die upon his bed and yet with pain. And that was the original King George before the late Queen Elizabeth here. He died in sickness on his bed after they were used to help do the things they could in the world wars, they were taken out of the way as a world power. And that king literally died in sickness on his bed. The current king is riddled with cancer, also potentially the same issue happening, dying in sickness on his bed for the condition of their kingdom as a state. That's just the reality of what they're living through right now. And it says, and for the two that remain shall be slain with a sword. 
For the sword of the one shall devour the other who was with him, but at the end he shall fall by the sword in the last days. As for you seeing two little wings from under the wings passing over the head that is on the right side, and you'd wonder why would one head destroy the other? Well, if you know that Rome's been trying to destroy America since we became a popular government, it makes perfect sense. They use us and then they are in the process, even right now, of destroying the institutions of our country. It's not lawful anymore. And it's just tanking because of the sins of the people. But that's why if we repent, that can be turned around. It says, as for you seeing the two little wings from under the wings passing over the head that is on the right side, this is the interpretation. It signifies that these are they whom the Most High Yahuwah has kept for the eagle's end. This was the rain which was brief and full of trouble as you saw. And the lion whom you saw rising up out of the wood and roaring and speaking to the eagle and rebuking her for her unrighteousness and all her words which you have heard. This is the Mashiach, or all the words which you have heard, sorry. This is the Mashiach which the Most High Yahuwah has kept until the end of days, who will arise from the posterity of Dawid, and will come and speak to them, and will denounce them for their mercilessness and for their wickedness. And he will cast up before them their contemptuous dealings. For first he shall set them living before his judgment seat, and shall rebuke them, then he will destroy them. For the rest of my people shall he deliver with mercy those that have been pressed upon throughout my borders, and he shall make them joyful until the end comes, the day of judgment, whereof I have spoken to you from the beginning. This is the dream that you saw, and this is the interpretation, and you alone are worthy to learn this secret of the Most High Yahuwah. Therefore, write all these things that you have seen in a book and put it in a hidden place and teach them to the wise among your people whose hearts you know to be able to comprehend and keep these secrets. But wait, you hear yourself yet seven more days so that you may be shown whatever it pleases the Most High Yahuwah to show you. And with that, he went his way. All right, so Abuin you get a sense of all that this fourth beast kingdom is going to be like with what we read here. Now we're going to cover the connection that ties in Rome being the Katim, so that you can see unequivocally that's where it is. If you have the book of Daniel available, the first mention of it in, is in there. And just this is another example of where you can see some intentional tampering. I'll give you another one just a little bit. Uh, of another spot for it but right here you can see it says zoom in as for the terminus ad cum of Qumran history as this is linked to the appearance of the Katim we have to determine who these people were it claims that in its primitive sense the word Katim described the inhabitants of Kition a Phoenician colony in Cyprus. It was really one of the original places where Katim's children might have been. And Hebrew Hebrew survivors from, uh, or Hebrew migrants colonies from Egypt had also went to Cyprus and then into Anatolia, or Turkey, if you will, and Greece proper. But it was never... Um, it was never Phoenicians by themselves. That's the point. Katim is the son of Yahweh, who's the son of Yepheth. The Phoenicians, even if you look, the cities of Tyre and Zidon were named after Canaanites. And if you look into the history of the Phoenicians, the people that took over those cities bought it from one and conquered the other. So they were Hebrew colonists. They were not um, pre- Egyptian or pre Moses Egyptian Hebrew colonists, just like the others that founded Troy, Attica, Colchis, and some other cities. They're Athens, 
but moving on. It says later in later the name tended to be applied indiscriminately to those living in all islands in most marine time countries. And this is Josephus's antiquities where that was tampered with. Another reference to Josephus being tampered with, I'll show you in just a moment, and you'll see very clearly that it was literally used to try to hide something. But it says, but from the second century BCE, the writers used, also used Katim more precisely to denote the greatest world power of the day. In the Maccabees, it is for the Greeks. And this is another one. Josephus tampered with to say that Katim is any islander, and right here in the Maccabees, it was meant it was pushed off to be the Greeks, which the Greeks are really the, the sons of Yahweh and Hebrews that had been intermixed, which we've already talked about before, but um not a few weeks ago in the, the video that we made about the Decalogue Stone, the Los Lunas, New Mexico uh Decalogue Stone, we cover that information. So I recommend you can check that out if you want to. But right here, this is what we want to cover for our purposes here. And this is what you can see in Daniel chapter 9 or chapter 11, verse 30. It mentions the Kittim sending ships. And all of chapter 11 here is about the Grecian Empire, the things that were going on with the kingdom, the beast kingdom during the reign of the Greek Empire after it was split into four. It's giving you details about the king of the north and the king of the south. The key right here is it being explained. So a lot of people will take that chapter and completely misconstrue what it talks about. They got some weird ideas about what it means, but it was known by, in history, it was already known that it applies to the Greek empire and how that all fits in. Right here, it says the Katim are the Romans. It was the ambassador of the Roman Senate, Populius Lenius, brought to Alexandria by ships of Katim, i.e. the Roman fleet, who instructed the king of the north, the Seleucid monarch Antiochus Epiphans, to withdraw at once from Egypt. The term Romans is substituted for Katim already in the Old Greek or Septuagint version of Daniel 11, verse 30. So, even in the Septuagint, in the original Greek translation that predated Daniel, uh, the coming of Rome, they had Rome for the Katim. Right? That's none of these texts is critical of the Katim. It's not talking bad of them necessarily. It's just mentioning them as the fact of who they are. They are seen as the ruling force of the time, but not as a hostile to Israel. In fact, in Daniel, they humiliate the enemy of the Yahudim because Antiochus was attacking them and he gets them to stop by confederating with them. You read about this, all of this, the all the foretellings in Daniel 11 here, you literally can read when you read the Maccabees because that's the times in which it was being fulfilled. But it says... Um, it was not till a later stage, especially after 70 CE, and all the Peshars and the Dead Sea Scrolls foretell that the coming of the Kittim would be destructive, but they weren't yet, right? It says that they come to symbolize oppression and tyranny. All right, this, by the way, is just a page. This is a scholar's writing. It's a, this is an introduction in part of what's called the Complete Scrolls. It's a collection of the Dead Sea Scrolls from the Penguin edition that was the original release of them in 1991. There's other versions available. You can also get the study edition, but the study edition I have in PDF as well does not have this information just plainly stated. The gentleman's read through the text and is just plainly stating what stuff is and where you can find it, which is why we're reading that instead of going through the text itself. Right here, I, I encourage you all, you can look at this and read through it to get an idea of what's going on with some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But for our purposes, we're focusing just on the connection with the Katim being Rome. Okay? It says, in the commentaries or the Peshars of Habakkuk and Nahum, 
The Ketim are represented as instruments appointed by Elohim to punish the unrighteous Kohanim of Yerushalayim, which is all of Josephus' uh, Wars of the Yahudim is actually what you see that playing out. Okay? The war rule, however, testifies to a changed attitude towards them on the part of the sect by making the Ketim appear as the chief allies of Belial, Belial, or Satan, and the final foe to be subjugated by the host of the sons of light. And that's in the war, the, the war rule scroll. The, the last battles between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, if you will, kind of like when Yahushua, the son of noon, brought them into the land to fight the Canaanites, right? This shows that the Ketim are the chief allies of Satan and the enemies of Elohim. <clears throat> and then right here, again, you can look at, we're going to look at this whole thing, but that's the part we want to keep in mind. It says, in Habakkuk's commentary, the portrait of the Katim is neutral, and you can read it for yourself and determine your own opinions, right? As in Maccabees and Daniel, and you can read about the accounts of them. We're going to look at a little bit here for when they came to power, right? You can see that in Daniel, it doesn't mention the Katim doing anything but sending their ships to stop the king of the north. They were not aggressors against the, the people of Elohim at that time, which is what it's trying to say here. In the Damascus document, they play no part. The alien adversary there is the chief of the kings of Greece. Feared and admired by all, they are seen to be on the point of defeating the last priests of Yerushalayim and confiscating their wealth, as they have done to many others before. Such a representation of the victorious and advancing might would hardly apply to the Greek Seleucids of Syria, who by the second half of the second century BCE were in grave decline. But it does correspond to the Romans, whose thrust to the east in the first century BCE resulted in their triumphs over Pontus, Armenia, and, Sel and Seleucid Syria. What we just read in the foretelling for Julius from Taitafi about some of the conquests that they would have. And finally, with the arrival of Pompey in Yerushalayim in 63 BCE, in the transformation of the Hasmonean state into Yahuda or Judea, a province of the Roman Republic. Since the identification of the Ketim as Romans is nowadays generally accepted, and I just gave you multiple witnesses you guys can dig into to, to prove that to yourselves, but this is a witness right here you can also show. I'll read through it and explain if you need to, okay? It says, It will suffice to cite a single but very striking feature in the Habakkuk commentary to support it. Interpreting Habakkuk 1, 14 through 16 as referring to the Katim, the commentator writes, quote, this means that they sacrifice to their standards and worship their weapons of war. Now it goes into how they it goes into great detail about all the stuff they're doing that they pillage and they fight and their conquests and they use that to acquire all these things and treasure and resources for themselves. It's quoting Habakkuk and things as applying to them in that capacity. But right here it mentions the worship of their standards. That's the key, okay? When you read about this reference in Josephus' writings, they tie it in to the abomination of desolation, of the worshiping of the standards. And it's quoted in there as the abomination of desolation, but that is a lie. That is to divert the attention of what the abomination really is, which was set up by Sixtus III on December 25th as the Christ Mass. So in, you can read these. I'm. I don't have to. Um, it, it's there for everyone to to see. But here's the proof of it. Habakkuk says that they worship their standards and weapons of war. Right here in War verse six or the War of the Yahudim, Book six, Section three sixteen, 
It says the Romans, now that the rebels had fled the city and the sanctuary itself and all around it were in flames, carried their standards into the temple court and setting them up opposite the eastern gate, there sacrificed to them. They worshiped their standards after they had their conquest, just like it was foretold before it happened. And that is that fourth beast kingdom that they call the Katim. For a, uh, let me finish reading this real quick, and then I'll show you a third witness that they worship their standards in just a moment. It says, it is also worth noting that the Katim of the war scroll, the final opponents of the astrological Israel or Yisrael, are subject to a king or emperor, a melech. Previously, in the commentaries of Habakkuk and Nahum, they are said to be governed by Moshalim, by rulers. All right. In some, therefore, the time the time limits of the sex history appear to be at one extreme, the beginning of the second century BC, and at the other, the same moment during the Roman Imperial Epoch, i.e., after 27 BCE. Now, this is from people who don't believe that they have foretelling purposes. But if you, they knew that he would have a king eventually and not just governors, it would be in there because our creator knows the future, right? But this is another evidence of them being the Roman Empire because it went from rulers back to a king or emperors in that capacity. All right, the next section right here, this is from what's called the Ancient History of Caldonia. It is a history of the righteous remnant of some survivors that left Egypt before the death of the firstborn. They founded Troy, and they were the righteous remnant that left before it was destroyed. And it was just a righteous remnant that kept true to what they called the laws of the altar that kept being miraculously delivered from persecution and troubles all the way until they went to Mantrojan or Montrose in what we call Scotland, where they had about a thousand years, generally, where they were unmolested by any any problems because they were obedient to the truth. But after they, the advent of our Mashiach, they had a rude messenger in Rome coming to them, and they were being attacked by Rome. Some of their men were made slaves, and they were actually partakers of the siege of Yerushalayim as slaves on the siege weapons just for some context of the timeline there. But right here, page 50 of 146, um, sorry, you can see that they had their female mighty one of a mermaid on the standard of the Roman army, and it was something that they would worship. Later on in the book, it actually mentions them making sacrifices and doing things like that, but we're not trying to get into all that grotesque stuff at this moment. The point is to show you there is other witnesses to confirm the facts that these are the ones that were being spoken of that worshiped their standards and were doing the things as mentioned in those Peshars. So if you don't know what the Dead Sea Scrolls say about it, this is a great incentive to go look, to take the time to study it. We don't have time to cover all these things right now, though. But before we wrap things up, I have one more reference just to make it as clear as day. This is from the Maccabees. It's from the five books of the Maccabees, an account that we have in our telegram there. And um, I'll try to make it available in the description. But right here, chapter 12, I believe this is book two. I might be mistaken. And... Please forgive me, but the book order in the PDF here is based on chronological order and not the names, not the normal ordering of the books. But right here is an account of the beginning of the power of the Romans and the enlargement of their empire. At this same time, of which we have been speaking, the affairs of the Romans began to be exalted that the great Antov Elohim might fulfill that which Daniel the foreteller, to whom be Shalom, had foretold concerning the fourth empire. So it directly mentions 
Rome being exalted concerning this fourth empire around this time. And then it mentions also Hannibal, who was a, a general of the Carthaginians that fought in the Punic Wars, the Second Punic Wars, I believe. If you're familiar with history at all, if you're not, I'm just speaking over your head, so I'm not going to continue there. But it's something you can look into. However, that's not our purposes. You can see Rome is directly called the fourth beast here. And you can see the, the footnote for confirmation or correction of this whole account respecting the beginning and enlargement of the power of Rome, the reader who is desirous of particular information will, of course, refer to the approved Roman historians. And approved or not, you can see the facts of things playing out. But the purpose is here is to show you that plainly they're directly said to be the fourth beast. And if that's the case, then they are the Katim, which make the which means they are Edom. And then for one last reference, just to put anything else to rest, this is something from the Apostolic Times after the coming of our Mashiach. I believe it's um I'll have the links and everything for you as well. But I believe it's Tertullian or someone speaking on the apocalypse and on the things that are in scripture. So I want to show you where I first learned of the reference right here. This is a book. It's book two of a two book series called Code Word Barbalon by a gentleman named P.D. Stewart. Who is, he's a, he was or is a Seventh-day Adventist. And it's a great book great series of books if you want to really dig in and exhaustively go over and prove the things that I'm trying to show you real quickly right here, all right? There's other books that also do an admirable job of that. The Illuminati Unmasked by, um, excuse me, Johnny Cerucci is another one that does an excellent job of covering that same, same information, the same facts, but it goes from secular and other points of view we're just going by the book and just using scriptures and inspired writings and foretellings to show these things they go out of their way to prove it in every other way imaginable including right here it was tertullian so thank sorry about that but you can see he makes reference he quotes tertullian here and then he quotes little horn pius the ninth who makes this declaration he says it is, therefore, by a particular decree of divine providence that at the fall of the Roman Empire, meaning pagan Rome, and its partition into separate kingdoms, the Roman pontiff, whom Mashiach made the head and center of his entire church, acquired civil power. Okay, that's when the papacy got temporal power, if you will. They were orig originally bestowed that from Constantine by being crowned. Sylvester was crowned, but it didn't culminate until the upplucking of the three horns, just as it was foretold, which we're about to read right here. So just one moment. I'm going to see if I have it correct. Father willing, it is right here all the way. If this isn't, we'll go back to the other one, but these are, this is larger, so it's easier to read. Just for context, this is right here, chapter 25 of Kadoshi John in the Apocalypse, equally explicit in asserting the same great doctrine. But this is a writing from Tertullian. Sorry, I, I'd have to, it's on the resurrection of the flesh. There we go. It, he's writing an epistle trying to say that we will be bodily resurrected. And in the course of that, this is some of the topic that he's covering. It's inadvertent because it's not directly about this, but it is very pertinent to what we need to cover. So it says, again, in the second epistle, he addresses them with even greater earnestness. Earnestness. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Yahuwah, Yahushua Mashiach, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, nor troubled, either by ruach or by word, that is, by the word of false prophets, 
or by letter, that is, the letter of false apostles, as if from us, as that the day of Yahuwah is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, unless indeed there first come a falling away. He means indeed of this present empire, and that the man of sin be revealed, that is to say, Anti-Mashiach, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or religion, so that he sits in the temple of El, affirming that he is El, and they literally have things where they call the little horn the Lord God. Right? Now we know that the, the Lord and God are titles that are unprofitable in relation to the truth, but all Gad, if you're real, right? We've covered that before. But this is a title that he literally is called by people who bow down and prostrate themselves to him, that kiss his hand like a dog, that where he sits on a throne, surrounded by cherubim, and people do this. It's literally in your face, blatant as can be, fulfilling these very things. And that's part of the Nicolaitan, they have to do it kind of thing. Remember, we've talked about that. It's their hidden wisdom for their perversion of amalgamating the stuff, good and bad. It says, do you not remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what detains, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of inequity does already work, only he who now hinders must hinder until he be taken out of the way. What obstacle is there but the Roman state, the falling away of which, being scattered into ten kingdoms, shall introduce Antichrist upon its ruins, and then shall be revealed the wicked one whom Yahuwah shall consume with the ruach of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan." with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. I'm willing that's making more sense to you all now. Then right here it says, In the revelation of Yahukanon again, the order of these things is spread out to view. Um, this part is not very... Yeah, this part is not really relevant to what we we're trying to cover. So you all can read it on your own if you'd like to. But before we let off there, I just want to show you one more time. You just read what it said there. And this is the quote from that little horn himself. From the Antimashiach himself, if you will. Even because of the position they're in, just like Caiaphas foretold and said relevant things for our regard because of the position he was in. You can see the same thing coming out of this man's mouth where he, he says, It is therefore by a particular decree of divine providence that at the fall of the Roman Empire and its partition into separate kingdoms, the Roman pontiff, whom Mashiach made the head and center of his entire church, acquired civil power. The very same thing where he said that once it's broken and the Roman Empire is taken out of the way, then the anti mashiach will come. So, Ab willing, that helped clarify some things for everyone. Um, please, if you have comments or questions or anything, don't hesitate to ask. But otherwise, you have a great rest of your Shabbat, a great Shavuot Tov or week ahead, and we will see you next time.